And I was wondering if you can tell us a bit more about the various types of redshift. Uh, what's the difference between a Doppler shift and a cosmological redshift? And why are cosmologists trying to make a distinction? Is there a distinction there? Okay, so th this might be a bit, slightly long-winded story, but let's let's set the scene first, right? So the important thing in, in the equations of relativity, right, is that the question of do you see a, a redshift between uh, an emission and an observer is to do with the mix of space and time at the emitter and the mix of space and time at the observer. Those are the things that dictate um, essentially what you're going to see with regards to light that's gone from one place to the other. Okay. So the question is, how do you change the mix of space and time for emitters and observers? So back in 1905, you had uh, Einstein's special theory of relativity. And he pointed out that one way that you can, you can change this balance of space and time is by having relative motion with respect to each other, okay? So you have two observers, they're moving relative to each other. One is moving away, the other is stationary to themselves. And they will have a different mix of space and time. So if you exchange a photon between those two, they will see a red shift or a blue shift because of the mix of space and time that they have. Now, 10 years after 1905, Einstein had the general theory of relativity, which incorporated gravity in the curvature of space time. And that's another way that you can change the balance of space and time for two different observers by having them in differently curved bits of space time. So the second kind of redshift, so you've got your special relativity one, which is often called the Doppler shift because it's to do with relative velocities. The second one is what's known as the gravitational redshift. So if, if you've got the gravitational field of the Earth and you ask about what does that gravity look like in terms of the equations of general relativity, what that tells you is that the curvature of space-time here on the surface of the Earth is different to, different to the curvature of space-time higher up. So in terms of Newton, we would say that we're at a different location in a gravitational field. So gravity is, is weaker up there. But in relativity, it's the curvature of space-time is changing. And if we fire photons up and down in a gravitational field, we would expect there to be an equivalent redshift in. And this was a, this was a famous experiment that was done, I think, in 1960s uh, at Harvard, uh, whereby they had a tower and the tower wasn't particularly tall. I think it was like 20 something meters that they were exchanging photons over. And you take a photon, you emit it at the bottom of the tower, you detect it at the top and it's red shifted. It looks like it's lost energy as it's climbed out of the tower. You take the photon, you send it down and it is blue shifted. So it looks like it has more energy when it gets to the bottom than it did at the top. So that was considered one of the you know, classic tests of relativity. So, Anytime you can get this change in the mixture of space and time for an emitter and observer, you should expect there to be a red shifting or blue shifting. So the other place that we can see that difference is in the expanding universe. So in the expanding universe, again, in the equations, what you've got is that the expansion of space, as it's called. But what that actually does for you is it says is that if I've got a source that emits uh, a photon at some point, point in the life of the universe, and then that photon travels, and I've got a, a, an observer, well, the space-time will have changed, even if they're, they're not moving relative to each other, the space-time will have changed just due to the expansion of the universe. And so when we look out into the universe and we, we see light emitted from objects um, out there, we're seeing them as they were in the past, we're seeing them as they were when the photons were emitted, we're detecting those photons today. And due to the difference in space-time back then to now, we see a red shifting of those sources. So no, normally when you pick up your, your GR textbook or your, you know, especially your, your undergraduate physics textbook, they will say there are three different red shifts. There is the, the Doppler, gravitational, and cosmological. Now, in reality, in reality, there are not three different. Uh, red shifts. There, it's not like there are three different sets of maths that you need to use for Doppler, gravitational, and cosmological. It's actually the same set of maths. It, it's, it's the same rule. If 
if the mix of space and time is different over there to here, then you get a red shifting or a blue shifting. And that's what we see in each of these cases. The reason why the mixture of space and time may be different, but it's the same, same principle in action. So underlying it, uh, there was a really nice paper, and I've forgotten how long ago it was published, and I've forgotten who wrote it. It basically just pointed out that if, if you remember this one rule about mix of space-time between there and there, that's all you need to, to know to calculate whether or not there's going to be a, a, a red shifting or a blue shifting of your photons. Okay, so what I struggle with a little bit is understanding how the three are actually related at the end of the day. If we take the view that space is expanding and space is some sort of medium like a loaf of bread, that's a common example that's used, or the surface of a balloon that is perhaps inflating or stretching, and that causes photons to actually stretch as well, causing them to redshift. But you mentioned that a redshift is supposed to be a relationship between an observer and the emitter. But if space is causing the photon to redshift, uh, it seems like you don't need an observer. You just need uh, the the photon itself with space. Uh, so to me, that that seems different. That there's there's a difference between the cosmological redshift and the Doppler redshift there. Okay, so so let's let's take these bits apart here. Uh, and uh, so you you brought up the the the, the raisin bread uh, example that people use to explain the expansion of the universe, right? So it's, you've got your bread and you've got in, in there, you've got your raisins. And as the bread expands, the raisins move apart. And it's just like an expanding universe, right? So it, that's an analogy. So can I give you an, another analogy that, that sort of makes, uh, sort of relates this? So uh, there's a, an apocryphal story about uh, Einstein being asked, how did the, the wireless telegram work? Okay. And so he said, well, look, firstly, to understand the telegram, let's imagine that we've got a cat that stretches all the way across the USA, right? So the, the cat's head is in New York. The cat's tail is in Los Angeles. And the telegram works by you tugging on the cat's tail and it goes meow in New York. And right? everyone goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's fine. That's a telegram. And he said, well, what about the wireless telegram? Well, it's, it's exactly the same, but without the cat, right? So... The, the key point is, is that the, the, the bread analogy works fine for explaining the universe, but you have to remember there's no bread, right? There's only raisins. So the, one of the mistakes I think people make is um, they, they try and give space physical attributes, right? That, that space is a physical substance and space grabs hold of photons and space pulls photons apart, you know, stretches them, etc. And it only takes a moment's thought to realize that that's, that, that has to be absolute nonsense, right? So let's, let, let's just make sure we understand what we're saying here when, when we talk about um, a photon. So in relativity, okay, we talk about photons, they, they, they're called null particles, right? So they don't have mass, they're null particles. And so you say, right, what properties does a photon have when it's traveling? And, and, and you might say, oh, no, my, my class tells me that it's got a wavelength, frequency, etc. It carries an energy. In relativity, if you ask what properties does a photon have when it's traveling, the answer really is none. It has no properties. A photon does not know what its wavelength is, right? Wavelength only means something to the emitter and to the observer, right? in between photons and null particles, and they don't carry that information. So firstly, you, you can't talk about stuff stretching when a photon doesn't actually carry the information of, of what's being stretched, right? So it's something to do with the emitter and the observer, which is why it's the mix of space and time at the emitter and at the observer that matters, okay? But you might say, oh, what if you put an observer halfway along? What do they measure? The, the photon's energy to be, right? Well, you've put somebody else in a different location in space-time, their mixture of space and time is going to be different again. They will see a different e e energy. And the way that it works out is that it looks like 
the, the wavelength is being stretched by space, but it's not. What's changing is the space time is changing at these different locations. And it's basically the wavelength scales with the expansion of the universe. So we can talk about it in that fashion. Right? So space doesn't grab hold of photons and stretch them. So someone might say that wasn't that the lesson from general relativity that space somehow has these properties that it is dynamic and it's there and has these properties where it can interact with matter and, and change their properties. What's wrong with that line of thought? Because that's not, not what relativity tells us. There was an article in, I think it was a new scientist more than a decade ago now, maybe much more than a decade ago, where they had um, Steven Weinberg and Martin Rees, I think were the two protagonists in there talking about what does expansion of the universe mean and I, I can't remember the quote exactly i can't remember exactly who said it but the quote is along the lines of how can space expand right space is is nothing how can space which has no physical properties expand and you can actually take that picture into the question of how can space and time bend right? Which is what, what we normally talk about with, with relativity. And if you read Weinberg's book on gravitation, uh, you know, which is considered one of the, the absolute classics, classic books of relativity, he has a section in there uh, titled something like the, the geometric analogy. And he's pointing out that the, we are using these words to describe what's going on in terms of the equations of relativity. We talk about curvature, etc. But that doesn't mean that space has this property of curvature. And in in reality, the way that you have to the, the way that you have to peel this back and ask about what is gravitation at its core, right? Gravitation is how mass talks to mass. And we insert space time in there as the medium that tells us how mass talks to mass. It doesn't make make space time a physical thing at the end of the day, right? Because in the equations of relativity, it's not a physical thing. It, it, there's, there's no physics of the stuff in there, i.e. I, there's no mechanism in there that says space interacts with light and stretches its wavelength. It's just not, it's not part of it. We might be treading slightly down the philosophical thing uh, path in the mo at the moment, but but essentially that that, that uh, what you find is that you people run into problems when they take analogies in relativity and then they push the analogies too hard. Uh, and you, you always have to go back to what the equations are telling you at the end of the day.